Hi there! So, in the 1980s, this weird NES game popped out of nowhere called Kid Icarus. You played as an angel, trying to claw your way up from the depths of hell to save the world. It featured a unique mix of action platforming, shooting, and Greek mythology. Now, on release, it was met with moderate success, plus a little puzzlement, but this success served to secure the game a sequel for Nintendo's handheld console, the Game Boy. Afterwards, however, there was nothing more from the series. But then, after 20 years of silence, a third entry, Kid Icarus Uprising, was announced for the 3DS. So, how was this series created back in the 80s, and what led to a sequel being released all those years later? Well, let us find out. This week we'll be looking at the NES original, and next week the 3DS sequel. But today, let us journey through Kid Icarus's development history. The year was 1986, one year after newbie game developer Toru Osawa joined Nintendo. Back then, a major part of the culture at the company was the idea that anyone can make games, and so Osawa was told he could develop a game himself. However, what he wasn't told was that he was going to be doing it completely by himself. He alone would be the one developing the game, abandoned by the rest of R&D1, where he worked. But the game, what would it be exactly? Well, at the time, developer Hiroji Kiyotake and his team were hard at work developing action game Metroid. Inspired by the running and shooting Kiyotake's game involved, Osawa too wanted to develop some sort of fast-paced action game. However, he was also a big fan of Greek mythology, so he decided to work this into the game as well. Plus, he decided to add, as he put it, the taste of an RPG. All of these elements came together to create a really unique sort of game, the likes of which had never really been seen before. And so, with his idea in hand, Osawa began actually putting the game together, turning his idea into a reality. He had a deadline of December. That was when the game had to be sent to the printers to print the actual physical games themselves. However, it soon became apparent that this was not going to be an easy process. As a rookie to not just Nintendo, but to game development itself, Osawa had a lot to learn. Now, as I mentioned, the studio were currently in the midst of developing Metroid. Osawa was promised that he'd receive reinforcements from the team once that game was finished, but until then, he was all alone. His initial idea for the story and tone was a sort of serious Greek-style adventure. However, the fellow Nintendo employees around him kept trying to persuade him to change this tone, and so Osawa eventually decided to go with a more humorous feel. For example, when creating the characters, he used some, uh, unusual sources of inspiration. For example, while Osawa was hard at work, it was bonus season at Nintendo. He kept thinking to himself, the bonus is coming out very soon, and couldn't get this bonus out of his mind. That inspired him to create a bonus-themed character. Bo in Japanese means stick, and Nasu means aubergine or eggplant. Bonus, stick eggplant. And so, Osawa resolved to create an aubergine-based character, carrying an aubergine on a stick. However, what would this stick be used for? Well, after thinking about it for a bit, Osawa settled on the idea of having the character place an aubergine curse on the player, turning them into an aubergine and so the aubergine wizard was created. Another character of unusual origin is Specknose. He was inspired by legendary composer Hirokazu Hip Tanaka. The team observed that he had a rather large nose, like unusually large. Sometimes people would turn up to Nintendo wearing these nose glasses things and would cry, it's Hirokazu Tanaka. Because of this, Osawa decided to add Tanaka into the game, in a way, by creating a character themed around Tanaka's most famous attribute. He drew a large nose, then added eyes and whiskers, and before he knew it, Specknose had come to life. Osawa described the character as irresponsible, but I think there's something weirdly charming about it. As you can see, there was a sort of playful, light-hearted atmosphere at this point in development, which bled into all the areas of the game, like the credit cards, for example. Not exactly a staple of Greek mythology, but why not? Now, around this time, Metroid finally came out. At last, it was time for Asawa to receive some help from the other developers at R&D 1. Well, not quite. 
While those sour kept slaving away, the Metroid team all took a break from work to resuscitate themselves. Osawa thought to himself, come on, hurry! Now, when Yoshio Sakamoto came back from his holiday, he returned to find a game that was, well, quite a way away from being completed. He immediately brought all the Metroid team on board, and the gang got to work. And when I say got to work, yeah, there was a lot of work to do. The team ended up having to work long, long days, every day. There were three months of almost constant crunch. The developers would sleep in the office using makeshift beds made from flattened cardboard boxes. And as autumn became winter, Nintendo began turning off the heating at night to save electricity. The team would go to bed late at night in the freezing cold and wake up at 8.15 the next day when normal work hours began. Their one respite was the sugary kirimochi that the team would heat up in the microwave using space cleared from their boss's desk. Now, around this time, Osawa embarked on a major life change. He got married. Unfortunately, work on Kid Icarus was not letting up, so he hardly had any time to see his family. Development was unbelievably busy, with the development team often working up to seven o'clock in the morning, trying to finish the game in time for the date when the physical games would be released. The last part of the game that Osawa worked on was the very ending. He wanted the last level to go out with a bang, so he came up with a whole bunch of exciting ideas for this last level. However, since the printing deadline was growing nearer and nearer, he decided to choose a single idea. But what would surprise the player? After pondering some more, Osawa thought to himself, let's go with horizontal scroll shooting. And so, with three days remaining until the final deadline, Osawa threw together this final level as quickly as he could possibly manage. He did make it in time, although with three days to go, there wasn't any time to put in a credits roll. Osawa thought to himself, I thought it took great pains to produce. But on the 16th of December 1986, Kid Icarus was released in Japan for the Famicom Disk System. A few months later, and it was released in English for the NES too. Now, the game received, well, mixed reviews. It's impossible to ignore the game's extreme difficulty. This game is really hard. Whether that's a good thing is up to personal taste, but many reviewers weren't too keen. However, the graphics were described as brilliantly drawn and the music as sublime, so not all was bad. All in all, the game sold a respectable 1.3 million copies by 2003. Now, there was one particular person who this game caught the eye of, Masahiro Sakurai. 26 years after playing this original game, he would go on to develop Kid Icarus Uprising, the critically acclaimed 3DS follow-up. But you'll have to wait till next week to hear about that. Until then, have a good one. Bye.